Hi, I'm Spencer Tillman. I grew up in Oklahoma, played right here on this historic turf. It's part of a program that was molded by greats like Benny Owen, Bud Wilkinson, Barry Switzer, and Bob Stoops. The tradition here at Oklahoma is as strong as the people who founded this great state and has been passed down from fathers and sons for more than 100 years. Norman, Oklahoma grew out of a desolate prairie in the early 1890s and became home to the state's university. Boomers and Sooners quickly planted the seeds that would grow into a story tradition of acclaimed academics and championship football. I'm proud to be a part of Oklahoma football and honored to take you on a journey through one of the nation's premier athletic programs. The gates of Oklahoma were swung open at noon today and restless torrents of humanity began to pour over its soil. The hunting ground of the Indian is now the home of the white settler. The wilderness of yesterday is a populated territory today. Every acre of land from the Canadian River to the Cherokee Strip has a claimant. Every quarter section has its squatter. Around the borders and railway stations, whole colonies are camped on single quarter sections. The land office here is besieged by an army of eager, impatient men who are fighting and struggling for a chance to file the records of their claims. New York Times, April 22, 1889. The land was bare. It was a prairie, just like you would find in Kansas. There were no trees here. There was no one living here. There were no Indians. There were no white people. There were no settlements. The only people that were living in this area worked for the Santa Fe Railroad. The Santa Fe had a train station in Norman, in Oklahoma City, and they had a station master at each of those stations. Other than that, there was nobody here. So what happened in Oklahoma City, for example, the day before the land run, they had a population of around 10 or maybe 12 people. By the evening of the land run, an estimated 10,000 people were living in what would become Oklahoma City. Roughly the same thing happened in Norman. Two railroad workers, Dale Larsh and Tom Wagner, saw great potential in the land surrounding Norman. Because workers were prohibited from participating in the land run, the two quit their positions and rode the train into the territory as settlers led their horses and wagons. Overnight, the 320-acre town site had a population of 150 people. Knowing that it was unlikely that Norman would become the territorial capital, Larsh and Wagner wrote a bill to establish the territory's university in Norman. Even though Norman had yet to produce a high school graduate, the governor signed the bill on December 19, 1890, giving Norman a unique attraction to settlers. The University of Oklahoma officially opened in 1893 with an enrollment of 119 students and was located one half mile southwest of town, connected by one of the longest boardwalks in the territory. The university building was the pride of the new settlers, the lone two-story red brick building standing alone on the prairie. Another 89er who came here and whose name we remember because there's a street just south of the campus named for him was Anton Klassen. Between the time he came here in 1889 and he died in December of 1922, he planted something over 300, possibly 400,000 trees in Edmond, Oklahoma City and Norman. It was a part of his desire to see this area become beautiful. Uh, the, the landscape around the buildings and around the city and around the campus would, would be as beautiful as the buildings were that they were building on the campus. After two years of recreational football on campus in 1893 and 1894, OU President Dr. David Ross Boyd sent a letter to John Hartz asking him if he would be interested in coming to the University of Oklahoma and organizing a football team. Hartz, a former student and football player at Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas, came to Norman, singing the praises of a hard-hitting new game known as football. He quickly pulled together a roster and began teaching the game of football. A committee selected crimson and cream as the school's colors, and the first game of the year was scheduled against Oklahoma City High School. The game was a rout as the more experienced high school team produced a shutout. 64 to nothing. From the very beginning, it was a group of ragtag, uh, tough guys uh, playing a rudimentary game, unorganized, 
a sandlot style football played on open fields with uh, buffalo wallows and, and, and standing water and it was a tough man's game from the very beginning. Hartz left the school to prospect for gold in the Arctic, but he left behind an infectious desire for football in the Indian Territory, 12 years before statehood. Oklahoma played without a football coach in 1896, but still produced the school's first victories, both over Norman High School, 12 0 and 16 4. In 1897, Vernon Parrington was recruited by President Boyd to teach English and also was drafted as Oklahoma's second head football coach, in addition to serving as the athletic director, trainer, manager, and team publicist, all without additional compensation. It was an astute hire. Parrington, who later won a Pulitzer Prize, had learned the game in the vaunted Harvard program. A refined gentleman, the new coach was surprised to find players who were so short on equipment that they let their hair go long to protect their heads. Guys would put on their rough work pants and their work boots and roll up their sleeves and go play. And it was a rough activity, lots of broken bones, bloody noses, and so forth. And you, you got to remember what kind of people were, were playing this game. What kind of people had migrated to Norman, Oklahoma? It was people that were pretty rough to begin with, that, that were willing to take a chance to explore. And this game appealed to them for just those kinds of reasons. Because in, in early day football, the strongest survived. Kingfisher College served as Oklahoma's first collegiate opponent as Oklahoma's 15 players traveled for the first time by train to Guthrie. What they would do in those days is the football games were the undercard to the oratory contest. So they would uh, oftentimes load up and, and go to another place for, uh, to, to, to give speeches and do oratory. Uh, there were a lot of school chants that were born out of those same contests. And in this case, they went to the territorial capital of Guthrie uh, for a contest, and they decided to also play a football game. And it was the first one against another college, against Kingfisher College, which is now defunct. Um, but that game had uh, a lot of personality to it. Uh, early in the game, the referee had to stop the contest because, uh, as you can imagine, the, the equipment was very primitive at those points. And one player had taken the elbow joints off of a stovepipe and had actually put those on, on both of his arms. And so he had injured players uh, during the game. It was obvious that something uh, was not quite right. So they stopped the game and made him remove those, those uh, iron pieces from his arms. Um, then in the second half, the Logan County Sheriff had not been tipped off to the fact that a football game was going to occur. And, and few people had ever seen a football game at that point. So he shows up at the site thinking that some sort of a brawl has broken out and he, he stops in and, uh, and stops the game. And uh, uh, President Boyd was among the people who convinced him that this actually was a, a, an athletic contest and, and not a fight. And, uh, and he resumed, allowed the game to resume and he did so by firing his gun to, to start play again. And OU won that game 17 to 8. Most of the spectators, ignorant of football but well acquainted with steer roping, gave the battle a rodeo air by shouting from the sidelines, hold that steer, ride to him, boy, yippee! Harold Keefe, Oklahoma kickoff. With two wins in the only games of 1897, the excitement for football was sky high across campus. Despite increasing interest, it was the oratorical contest and not football that was the university's major activity in those days. Before the contest, the crowds would chant, These contests spawned the phrase Boomer Sooner and gave new life to the interstate rivals that would soon spread to the gridiron. Although the 1898 Boomer Sooner phrase was catching on, Parrington's 1899 team donned the nickname Rough Riders after Teddy Roosevelt's Spanish-American War Regiment, a name that stuck for the next six seasons. The turn of the century brought great anticipation as Dr. Lawrence Northcote Upjohn introduced basketball to the university, and the Rough Riders played their first game against the more experienced University of Texas, who had been fielding the team since 1883. Using horse collars for shoulder pads, Oklahoma's only losses would come at the hands of Texas in 1901 and 1902. 
former player Fred Roberts returned to the program and was hired as head coach in 1901. At the time, it was not uncommon for coaches to step onto the playing field, and Roberts scored two touchdowns against Baylor as a player and head coach. Coaching football was not a viable career option at the time, and Roberts declined to return for the 1902 season, leaving the Rough Riders without a coach for their first three games of the 1902 season. The Rough Riders then embarked on a tumultuous 72-hour train ride to Austin. To them, it was an adventure. And, and while they had to have been weary when they arrived and play a game and ride back on the train, it was an ordeal to those of us looking at it today. For them, it was a grand adventure. Oklahoma returned bruised and battered with losses against Texas and the Dallas Athletic Club, but not without a head coach. During the trip, they hired Mark McMahon. It was a Texas Railroad team. It was the first game that they ever played, uh, that OU ever played at the fairgrounds in Dallas. And they went down and played the game and lost, and, uh, and McMahon recognized that OU didn't have a, a coach. And so uh, when the game was over, he went over to the team hotel and, and interviewed for the job, essentially. He had a background playing at Texas, and Texas was more developed at that point uh, and had a little bit more background in football. Um, the players at OU respected his knowledge uh, and obviously respected the fact that they had just lost to his team. So they decided to hire him, and they paid him $250, and he became the head coach. In 1903, Oklahoma managed a 6-6 tie with the newly named Texas Longhorns. The team was given a hayride and was paraded through the streets in celebration for not losing to either Texas or Texas A&M. They did, however, lose their coach at the end of the season as McMahon moved to Durant, Oklahoma to practice law. Fred Buck Ewing was hired as the fifth coach of the University of Oklahoma in 1904, a year that would also see for the first time taped ankles a university band, and the first game against the Oklahoma Aggies in Guthrie. The game at Cottonwood Creek was played on a neutral site between Oklahoma A&M from Stillwater and Oklahoma University on a neutral site in the park at Guthrie, which was the territorial capital, so it made sense. And the land in the park where this game was played is low, and the creek was running full of water in a game where there is no end lines. It's possible uh, to score simply by uh, running the ball as far as you could before you got to the creek or to the street on the other end. The A&M punter re uh, goes into punt formation to punt the ball, uh, kicks a high ball, and it blows back over his head toward the creek. And there's a mad scramble to recover the, the pigskin. The ball bounces into the water, into the creek, and Ed Cook, who was a very adept swimmer, dove into the creek along with other players, got the ball, swam to shore, pulled it out of the water, and set it down on the ground for a touchdown. And uh, Oklahoma won that game 75 to nothing. It's a little like recess, you know. Uh, really, there's not any, if you think about it, there's not too many boundaries on recess football either. It's sort of tackle the man with the ball wherever he goes. Uh, I think that's what football was like in those days in that game at Cottonwood Creek. Uh, tackled the man with the ball and the ball was going down the creek so everybody went in the creek. There weren't a lot of details. It was, uh, there's the ball, go get the ball, and if it's ball's getting wet, you get wet. Every player for the Rough Riders scored in the contest, including the center, Roy Wagner, who took a lateral from the quarterback before diving in for a touchdown. The elation was short-lived as they lost to Texas 50-10 in what was the first ever matchup between the schools at the State Fair of Texas in Dallas. The season concluded with a 36-9 loss to Bethany College, a school coached by Benny Owen. The victory was Owen's second over the Rough Riders, the first coming in 1903 in a game where not a single penalty was called. The terrible Swedes from Lindsborg, Kansas were known for their clean style of play, voiding penalties and unnecessary roughness. It was Owen's reputation for good sportsmanship it caught the eye of OU University leaders as Coach Ewing left the head coaching position for medical school in Chicago. Benjamin Gilbert Owen was only 17 when he and his young mare, Beauty, raced into Oklahoma Territory as part of the Cherokee Strip land run of 1893. Too young to stake a claim, Owen returned to his home, coveting the unknown, 
curious as to what Oklahoma would become. Soon thereafter, the 126-pound boy from a farmhouse outside of Arkansas City, Kansas, enrolled at the University of Kansas to study pharmacy and Latin. He also studied football and learned the game from one of its early day innovators. There he encountered Fielding Yost. Hurry up Yost, one of the great innovators of the game of football. And Yost had ideas about how you, through repetition, become a well-drilled team. And he used surprise, experimenting with the pass and all once it was permitted by the rules. And Benny, all the while, is playing quarterback for, for fielding Yost before Yost leaves for Michigan. But then he becomes the head coach at tiny, tiny Bethany College in Lindsborg, Kansas. And Oklahoma has a couple of games with Bethany College. And what the Oklahoma observers see in Owen is a man who is a true gentleman, who is a sportsman, and who inculcates in his players uh, a sense of fairness and integrity and hard-nosed competition, all of which was appealing to them. During Owen's three-year tenure at Bethany, he won more than 90% of his games directing the hurry-up offense that he learned from Fielding Yost. With the university's athletic association $712 in debt, Benny Owen accepted the head coaching position at the University of Oklahoma in 1905, turning down an offer from the University of Pittsburgh in 1903, and leaving the same position at Bethany College as coach and chemistry teacher to accept a three-month contract for $900. Owen's salary as football coach at Oklahoma was not sufficient for him to live here year-round. And so in the summers, he would return to Arkansas City and run the family restaurant and return in September uh, for the start of school. And so, of course, that sounds bizarre today given contemporary coaches' salaries, but that's the way it was. The 1905 season witnessed the drafting of the school's fight song, Boomer Sooner as it was adapted from a mix of Yale's Bula Bula and North Carolina's I'm a Tar Heel Born. Owen led his team, dubbed the Boomers for the first time, to a victory in its first game as head coach, defeating Central Oklahoma 28-0. Owen's arrival on campus also brought OU's first victory over Texas. With only one minute remaining in a scoreless game, the Boomers center, Robert Severn, wrapped up Texas's captain, Don Robinson, and carried him across the goal line for safety. The crowd erupted in jubilation, knowing the victory over Texas was certain, and rushed the field. The result of the game may be that Texas will hereafter refuse to play these small colleges unless it can be here, in Austin, or at some place where all the arrangements can be made beforehand to eradicate any such foolish performances as were tolerated in Oklahoma City. Austin American Statesman. Oklahoma finished the 1905 season the same way it finished 1904, facing Bethany College, and OU and the Boomers again prevailed, 29-0. Rough play led to multiple deaths in the 1905 season, and the country began to question the physical nature of the game as the government would begin to intervene. The early game was so rough that it actually led to the formation of the NCAA. Uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were a number of deaths, a lot of which were attributed to the uh, formation that was called the Flying Wedge. And uh, in 1906, it became so serious that President Teddy Roosevelt actually formed a committee with a number of colleges at that time to discuss rules changes that would take place. And, uh, and the way he formed that group was that he threatened to, to end football in total if, uh, if they didn't reach some resolution. So it was a barbaric game in the early stages. There has never been a president that was more pro-activity and pro-sports than Theodore Roosevelt. And so he took a personal interest in the game. He'd watch the game. And so 1906 is the first opportunity there was to, to uh, document rules of the game that could then be distributed and adhered to by officials. And so what you find is rules that were intended to spread the field a little bit and prevent serious injuries. The most significant rule changes included reducing the length of halves from 45 to 30 minutes, and first down lengths grew from five to 10 yards per three downs. In addition, 
Tackling opponents out of bounds was prohibited, as was striking offensive players with the palm of the hand. Even more significant, however, was the addition of the forward pass, an innovation for which Benny Owen earned much credit. Most teams found the pass to be too risky and omitted it from their playbooks, but Owen forged ahead. The team fashioned a 5-2-2 two two record, a mediocre prelude to a gloomy 1907. The tumultuous year included the loss of a university president, a fire in the administration building, and a life-altering accident for Owen, just two games into the season. Benny Owen's life changed dramatically uh, in 1907. It, it was a year that, that had a lot of turbulence and uh, a lot of personal turbulence for him uh, in that he and the local pharmacist, John Barber, had gone out to hunt quail. It was either the first day of the hunting season or very close to the first day. And they had gone out south of Norman and, uh, and they go out uh, and have a day of, of hunting quail. And on their way back in, uh, they're riding on a wagon and uh, one of the dogs shifts and, and it's unclear whether uh, it was just a dog that moved or whether the dog was actually going to try to jump off the wagon. Benny had his shotgun laid across his lap and he moved to steady the dog and when he did uh, the gun discharged into his armpit and uh, so obviously that's a very traumatic injury and uh, they immediately applied a tourniquet and came back into town and uh, the first doctor that they went to and this is along what is still Main Street in Norman uh, it just so happened that that doctor also was out hunting quail that day. And so as legend has it, Benny then walked a block to the east to another doctor and, and it was there that he, he was attended to. They nursed the arm along as best they could. It, it became obvious that it couldn't be salvaged and, uh, and a surgeon was brought in from Oklahoma City and the arm was removed. So uh, now every picture you see of Benny is, is missing uh, an arm and, uh, and it was in a hunting accident that that occurred. And the interesting thing about that is um, he only missed like three games. Uh, he, he was back very, very quickly after that happened. So um, pretty rough hewn guy and, and uh, pretty tough to get through what was a very difficult accident. He had the arm of his coat pinned up, the sleeve of his coat pinned up and he was back out there with one arm, coaching his players, giving instruction, doing his best uh, with total disregard for his own limitations. He met his wife at a dance in Norman after he had lost his arm. And they married and had a marvelous life here in Norman, had three daughters. And so it never was a limitation. Toughness was expected from Owen's players, as he believed that conditioning, not protective equipment, would ultimately protect his players from injury. Each man furnished his own equipment, as Owen practiced his players rain or shine, accompanying them on cross-country runs as he carried a switch in hand for any players that fell behind. Charlie Wantland was a player who showed up uh, early on to play on one of his teams and uh, uh, Charlie had brought with him a football helmet uh, thinking that he would need it for practice and when he went out to the field uh, he came up on the field and he saw that none of the players had on any equipment so he stashed his helmet uh, in a bush and ran out on the field too embarrassed to take a piece of equipment with him but uh, Coach Owen's teams were, were fortunate probably they didn't have more injuries but there was certainly a toughness element that went along with that. Along with the establishment of a varsity basketball team in 1907, President Theodore Roosevelt officially made Oklahoma the 46th state, and the Boomers began their first season representing their state on the gridiron. Several games into the season, a wild group of students formed a group known as Sooner Rooters to cheer on their team against Arkansas. Following a 27-5 victory, the student newspaper reported on the group's account, and the school then adopted their newest nickname, the Sooners. The new nickname brought with it a dose of magic as the Sooners posted shutouts in their next two games, including a 50 to nothing rout of Texas. Owens boys completed the campaign with an eight one and one record, the best in school history to that point. Rivalries were prominent in the early days of Oklahoma football and they were greatly anticipated by fans of both sides bad blood still existed when Oklahoma traveled to Arkansas in 1903, when Razorback fans pelted Oklahoma players with rocks and officials neglected to stop flagrant play. It happened again in 1909, only to a greater degree, as Arkansas spectators again brought rocks to the game, 
and one fan pulled out his six shooters, firing two shots into the turf and yelling, that Oklahoma bunch won't cross this goal. I'll see to that. Oklahoma did score despite the trigger happy fan, but couldn't overcome the Razorbacks alumni who served as referee and umpire. The defeat led to a rare occurrence when Oklahoma players saw Coach Owen lose his cool. We'll never play Arkansas in another game of football as long as you have this kind of setup. Benny Owen, October 30th, 1908. True to his word, the Sooners did not play Arkansas again until 1914, when the Sooners won 35-7. Football was gaining momentum in Norman, and improvements to the stadium began as a sprinkler system was installed and a ticket booth was added to the entrance. Theodore Roosevelt's Rules Committee blossomed into the NCAA and tweaked several rules affecting game play in 1910. The direct pass, a modern-day shotgun formation, was written into the rule book, and Owen infused the strategy in his own playbook. Blessed with capable players, Owen surprised teams with his new tactics throughout the 1910 season. Claude Rees took center stage and became Oklahoma's first All-American. It was Claude Reed's play at multiple positions, and specifically his booming feats at punting, that helped carry the Sooners to a successful 1910 campaign. The limit of three plays ensured punting duels in many games, and Reed set a Sooner record with a 107-yard punt against Texas to help preserve a 3-0 victory. OU marched undefeated through the 1910 campaign and notched a 104 nothing shutout of Kingfisher College to open the season. Fan interest reached an all-time high as 80% of the student body voluntarily purchased their season tickets for $5. Townspeople also filled downtown Norman's Main Street to listen to away games, not wanting to miss a moment of the incredible season. And Norman at, the, at, that, time, at that time, in the teens, uh, the only method of communication instantaneous was the telegraph. And so when the, when the Oklahoma team was playing away in another state, the only reports were received during the course of the game were by telegraph. And a piece of plywood was painted, 100-yard field with hash marks and, and line markers. And the uh, telegraph operator would place uh, different colors of, of figures on the board and announce the Sooners are on the 20-yard line. The Sooners have punted and place the little ball, the little wooden ball on the field and the townspeople would stand in the street and look up to observe the goings-on and the pictures that we have are just marvelous to think that on a Saturday afternoon that uh, townspeople would gather in the street that interested in the action taking place in Lawrence or Columbia or elsewhere. After defeating Missouri 14-6, expenses and fatigue kept the Sooners from traveling back to Norman, as they instead stayed in Columbia for several days before traveling to Lawrence. With limited travel options, long road trips were common, but a necessity, as financial shortfalls required the Sooners to make appearances in other towns wanting to see the Sooners of Oklahoma. And if you go back to the early days and the Ben Owen uh, era, they'd schedule three or four, if they had to play on the road, they'd schedule two or three games on the road where they were taking the train to the first game, then they'd take the train to the second game, then to the third game, and then back to Norman. Kansas had pounded Oklahoma for eight consecutive years, outscoring the Sooners 126 to nine. The tide finally turned. The Sooners 3-0 victory in a game of several field goal attempts ignited something of a common response, a celebration in the streets of Norman. There was often, uh, after a great victory, uh, a gathering of, of townspeople at the train station to welcome the team and little celebrations. And there are examples where the team is loaded onto wagons and paraded down Main Street, followed by a, a motley crew of inebriated and sober fans and uh, enjoying the moment. In 1912, Owen's up-tempo style benefited from rules changes that shortened the field to 100 yards, added a fourth down, and most importantly, opened the door to passes of any distance. 
The year was highlighted by a 21-6 win over Texas at Gaston Field on the Texas State Fairgrounds. After a disappointing 5-4 season, enthusiasm surrounding Benny Owen waned, although finances doubled from the season before, with profits reaching $6,945. That spring, Owen gained a bride in Nina Besant and a new university president in Stanton Brooks. Brooks became one of Owen's greatest proponents and actually spared him from a firing handed down by state legislators. Benny Owen by now was really establishing a football program, but it was early in the Brooks administration as the president of the university that somebody in the state legislature suggested that they fire a teacher at one of the smaller colleges because that teacher was being paid to teach piano, but the teacher was missing an arm. And the legislature said, how can you have a one-arm piano teacher teaching piano and then only have one arm? And somebody else said, you got a one-arm football coach down at the University of Oklahoma. How can he coach football with one arm? And so they recommended that he be fired. In 1912, Oklahoma had been a state for five years. And just imagine the kind of characters that were in that legislature and how meddle meddlesome they would have been into personnel matters primarily at OU. Across the board, the debate over someone's interest in seeing a, a piano teacher discharged, uh, then there was spillover on the one-armed football coach, Benny Owen, uh, resulting in a, in, a, uh, in a law or a resolution for him to be discharged at the state's university. Uh, Benny never knew about this. Stat, uh, Stratton Brooks, the president at the time, hired him back. But it's, it speaks more to our rough and tumble politics in Oklahoma than it does to anything about Coach Owen, of course. The sport was evolving, and even though rules changes were being implemented to make the game safer to play, the tough and gritty attitude of the players was not washed away. Sabe Hot, who was the only player to wear a helmet in the 1912 season, suffered an awful accident before the 1913 season. Uh, while working, not, not related to football, a nail ricochets and hits him in the eye and he loses an eye in the process. Um, his family obviously does not want him to play football again, but he forges on and, and goes out and plays football. And so what he would do during the games was he would take out his glass eye, wrap it up, put it in his locker, and then he would wrap gauze uh, around his head and, uh, and take the field that way. So you can imagine what a sight he would have been running out on the field. There were three hots on the team uh, when his brothers came out to join him as well. There was a need for more alignment, so they became known as the terrible hots. And so uh, another story of the toughness of the early days of Sooner football. The Sooners lost just two games in the 1913 season to Missouri and Texas. And although not nationally recognized, Oklahoma was developing some of the greatest players in the country. Get your morning paper, morning star, read all about it. Latest football scores. Before 1960, the Eastern press, mainly the New York newspapers, were the equivalent of today's ESPN. They sort of formed the agenda. They uh, formed the opinions. They told you what was important and who was important. The Eastern press was not all that uh, interested or knowledgeable or anything else about uh, Oklahoma or its football team. Um, you know, people like Walter Camp, uh, people like uh, Grantland Rice, uh, people uh, on the East Coast, they were not closed-minded, they were open. Uh, you know, Oklahoma, OU had all Americans OU football Americans in the, in, uh, the teens, 1913, 1915, with Claude Reeds and Spock Geyer. But, um, you know, there's, there's no, reason to take, uh, no reason to take a hard look at a place like Oklahoma when you had Harvard and Yale and Army and Navy and then later Notre Dame and Michigan and all these places that were easier to get to, a lot more established. Uh, it, it just takes time to build that, that name and that recognition, uh, but eventually it came. With Reed's finishing his eligibility, Owen would not have to wait long for his next star, Forrest Spot Geyer, to step onto the campus in 1914. A product of Norman High School, Geyer earned his nickname Spot because of his natural ability to throw the ball on the run and hit any receiver on the spot. Owen's aerial offense, a fast but light team that averaged just 158 pounds, led the nation in scoring with 431 points. The 20th anniversary of Oklahoma football could not have been scripted any better. 
an undefeated season, the inaugural Southwest Conference Championship, an All-American winner in Geyer, the 100th win in Oklahoma history, and an incredible victory over the University of Texas. This place was nutty. This campus was football mad with, uh, you know, go down to Texas and play a game and people standing on the street corner with the, getting results over the, uh, over the telegraph lines and people going down to the train station and waiting for the uh, team to come home and, and carrying the guys on their shoulders through the streets after a big victory. Bud Wilkinson didn't invent that, Benny Owen did. The postgame celebrations were famous. There were a lot of them that occurred uh, through the years and uh, one of them was in 1915. Oklahoma had knocked off Texas and uh, they came back and they had a pep rally at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And what they decided to do was to uh, parade the team and the band up and down Main Street. Well, they did this on a wagon that had to be pulled by the students. The plan was to take Monday off as a holiday, which has occurred several times, that uh, a win over Texas would result in classes being canceled on Monday. The fans and the students had decided that that would just be the case. So on Sunday, they have this big celebration, planning to not go to class the next day and have a big barbecue. Well, uh, President Brooks decides that the barbecue is okay, but it's not okay to take the day off from school. So Brooks, who was pretty savvy on things like wagons and buses because he had grown up on a farm in Michigan, had had the uh, wheels and the axle on the wagon ungreased so that when they pulled this team up and down Main Street, it, was, it took quite a yeoman effort to get there. The students were so exhausted they were too tired to protest about the lack of a holiday. The support was loud and raucous across campus for Oklahoma, and student groups began forming on campus in support of their beloved Sooners. One group in particular established their story tradition in 1915. Their name credited to a local Normanite. The name began at an OU Oklahoma A&M basketball game in 1915. Uh, they were a bunch of primarily OU football players who were in the stands making a lot of noise, taunting the, uh, the OSU players or the Oklahoma A&M players at the time. Uh, and a woman stood up and said, you roughnecks be quiet. And at the time, roughneck was basically a term used for carnival hands. So you can think of the roughnecks as kind of an artifact of the 1920s. Uh, the collegiate experience of stuffing pledges into a phone booth and eating goldfish. Uh, and there were a lot of different organizations like the roughnecks on campus uh, in the 1920s when the roughnecks really got started. Um, but the roughneck survival really goes along with the, the uh, ascension of OU football. The undefeated season beckoned calls from Kansas and Nebraska looking to hire away the popular Owen. He declined, stating that he enjoyed the development of a football program as much as the coaching. To show their appreciation for the incredible 1915 outcome, students and fans presented Benny with the Hudson Super 6 automobile. Owen put the new roadster to practical use, using the lights to illuminate Boyd Field so he could practice long after dark in the 1916 season. The Sooners were lackluster in conference, tying for third place with a 6-5 overall record, as football took a back seat to the terrible conflict that had broken out globally, World War I. Before the 1917 season began, 13 of OU's 20 returning players left the team to enlist. The young Sooners got off to a quick start, with a 99-0 pace scene of Central Oklahoma, before a record-setting 179-0 win over Kingfisher College. In that game, kicker Arlo Davis split the uprights with 19 extra points. As the roster depleted slowly, the team crumbled, finishing the season 6-4-1 and, and leaving Owen searching for answers. With the war in full swing, Oklahoma City was struck on October 3, 1918 with an influx of Spanish influenza. Some 1,000 cases were documented in just 48 hours. The outbreak caused several games to be canceled, including the annual matchup with Texas. The Sooners won every game they played, but the shortened schedule prevented the team from being awarded their second Southwest Conference Championship. The 1919 season featured 26 returning lettermen, but a sputtering offense left the Sooners with a third place finish in conference play. New conference affiliation and a new mascot ushered in the 1920 season. Oklahoma joined the Missouri Valley Conference and moved its home games to the present site, where Mex the Dog patrolled the sidelines. New league rules prevented Oklahoma from playing Texas, and the Sooners completed an undefeated season and brought home their second conference championship and more individual honors. 
Roy Soupy Smoot was a, uh, an All-American lineman in 1920, but he was also a gifted singer. He was an, he was an opera singer. So in 1921, he takes the season off to go sing opera, uh, tours the country doing that, uh, and then comes back after that and, uh, and rejoins the team. But he's one of the real interesting early characters and, uh, and probably a good example of how diverse the players were back in those days. They were committed to football, but they had lives outside of the game as well. The next three years were rough for the Sooners on the field, winning only seven games while their coach pushed for a new 30,000-seat stadium. Owen worked hard on the campaign, seeking to raise $500,000, as other schools such as Nebraska were already beginning construction on new facilities. What he did, most importantly, was to deliver a stadium at a very critical time, and that's why we have Owen Field today. Here's the reason. Benny married the banker's daughter in Norman and nothing uh, south of Brook Street uh, existed. It was open field. And it was Owen's dream to build a great stadium. And because of the dinner table conversations with his father-in-law, uh, he became familiar with what it would take, and that's to sell bonds to fund the construction of the stadium. And it was clear to Benny and his advisors that in order to do that and be successful at it in the early 20s, that they needed to add a student union building. So they did. They added, as a part of the bond issue, was the construction of a new stadium and, and the Oklahoma Memorial Union. Now why is the timing significant? Because the Depression was coming. Had Benny Owen not had this vision to deliver a great stadium. And had Benny Owen not acted when he did, it may have been after World War II before Oklahoma had a, a football stadium of any stature at all. So we have to give Owen credit for, for being a visionary and putting that deal together. He had the standing among the Oklahoma people to pull it off. It wasn't until November 11, 1922, that officials agreed with Owen that a new stadium was needed. During a matchup with Missouri, a pavilion was erected to accommodate a record number of fans. While the game was in progress, the structure collapsed, injuring several people and strengthening Owen's case for a new stadium. The construction was completed in time for the first home game at the current site of Memorial Stadium in 1923, a 62-7 victory over Washington University of St. Louis. The Sooners won only two games that season, and the future looked dim for 1924. Despite the return of Smoot from his opera singing tour, Owen suffered his worst season as head coach, finishing with a 2-5-1 record and placing six in the conference. The coach ramped up his efforts to build and promote the program, and even took it upon himself in 1925 to begin distributing tickets through the mail. If you've ever seen the ads or the posters for OU football in the 1920s, there was something on those that I have always found really intriguing. It would have the home schedule, and then it would say, to buy tickets, contact Benny Owen, the stadium, University of Oklahoma, Norman. So Benny Owen was selling tickets as well as coaching the football team and doing a myriad of other things as well. They didn't have a ticket office back then or a ticket manager. He was it. There was a new look for Oklahoma in 1925. For the first time, the Sooners took to the field with every player wearing leather thigh pads, cleated shoes, and a form-fitting leather helmet, although it was not required that players use the new headgear. With a new 16,000-seat stadium called Owen Field, season ticket holders and new university president, Dr. William Bennett Bazell, saw the Sooners finish the season 4-3-1. The Sooners had won three games and lost only one when they returned to Owen Field for their 100th home game, a contest against the Missouri Tigers. A record crowd of 16,235 watched as Linwood Bus Haskins' 32-yard field goal assured the Sooners of a 10-7 victory. The team split its next two games before traveling to Stillwater for a Thanksgiving date with Oklahoma A&M. Some 1,000 supporters made the trip from Norman. A stalemate ensued as the Aggies and the Sooners ended the game in a 14-14 tie, a curious way to conclude the era of Benny Owens' coaching career. The coach retired the following February, 
with an impressive 122, 54, and 16 mark. More importantly, he left a legacy that set Oklahoma on a path for football greatness. That tells you all that you need to know about Benny Owens standing in the coaching profession. Rockney's at Notre Dame in the Chicago market. Yost is at Michigan. Camp is, is from the East Coast. And so uh, here's Benny Owen at Oklahoma. Now, how likely is it that a coach at Oklahoma would be included in that company? It had to be a man of immense stature in the coaching profession. Oh, Benny Owen, uh, I just want to say this about Benny Owen. Benny Owen was a great man. He had a great character. He was, he was religious. Uh, you could always depend on what he said. And I think that is the reason that we had a pretty good football team while he was coach. So I was playing under him. Hard pressed to find a story of a man who uh, more embodies Oklahoma in the first 50 years of, of our existence than Benny Owen. Um, a guy who was uh, a sharp guy, he knew what he was doing, but he was also uh, had the experiences uh, of, of the frontier and uh, you know was here, 19, came in 1905 to, to coach a little football and stayed you know, on, on, the, uh, on the payroll almost half a century. So, I mean, he's a guy that lived it all and um, you know, the, from the from the hunting accident that claimed his arm, to uh, you know, to the formation of the uh, of the stadium uh, that uh, still sits where he planted it. Um, I mean, he's he's a he's a landmark, epic figure, not just in OU football history, I think, but in but in university and state history. Benny Owen stayed on staff as athletics director to oversee the program. The state and OU football fans wondered if the program could maintain Owen's high standard in the hands of a different coach. Bethany College again provided Oklahoma's next head coach when Benny Owen hired Kingfisher, Oklahoma native, Adrian Ad Lindsay. Lindsay's first season was highlighted by a trip to the Windy City and a 13-7 win over the University of Chicago, coached by legendary Amos Alonzo Stagg. It was the first victory by the Sooners over a Big Ten Conference opponent but was also one of the few highlights of the season. OU won just two more games. The offseason again brought change in conference affiliation when the Big Six Conference was formed. Also that year, the Sooners lost perhaps their best four-legged friend. Max the dog was almost like a cheerleader. Uh, he had run up and down the sidelines. He'd bark at our players. He'd bark at the opposing players, growl at the, the opposing players. Um, and literally, it was just like a cheerleader. And because he was a dog, and because we all have affinity for pets, and particularly for dogs, he was adopted by every football player on every football team during the time that he was here. The uh, team took a trip up into Kansas, and uh, it was on the train, and uh, they had made a stop in our Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, when they got back to Norman, they realized that uh, somewhere along the way they had lost Max. Well, he was back at the depot in, in Ark City, Kansas. So they had to go uh, retrieve him. And the day Max died, they actually had a very elaborate uh, funeral on campus. Uh, there, there are a number of photos of it, of a big parade that took place on campus. And, uh, and Max the dog uh, was buried, uh, supposedly, at the stadium. Capacity of Owen Field grew to 30,000 and pressure to fill the stadium mounted on the shoulders of second year head coach, Ad Lindsay. Tom Churchill returned to the team from the Summer Olympics in Amsterdam after placing fifth in the decathlon. But the Sooners were mediocre again, finishing with a five and three mark. The start of the 1929 season began well, but slowed with the tough loss and the fall of the stock market. Oklahoma shut out Creighton 26 to nothing in the opener but then dropped a 21 to nothing decision to Texas at Dallas after signing a 10-year contract to play at the State Fair. Five days later, the stock market crashed and the world watched $30 billion disappear as the Great Depression began. The Depression was a problem, but in central Oklahoma, the Depression wasn't as much of a problem as you might think. And the reason for that was oil. For years, oil, much of it on Indian lands, 
has been the backbone of Oklahoma's wealth. Today, modern oil derrick forests have encroached upon the very capital in Oklahoma City. In 1929, they discovered oil in South Oklahoma City, and, in the, and then in 1930 through the mid and late 30s, they were drilling oil wells all over central Oklahoma, and so men had full employment. They could get jobs working on the oil rigs as tool pushers or whatever. Lindsay's teams failed to score a point in the final three games of the season, as his players were outmatched and overpowered. Fans expected improvement in 1931, when the Sooners faced a long 12-game season but the team achieved just four victories and the first losing season since 1924. Lindsay's detractors began to call for change. You'll often hear in athletics, don't follow a legend, and uh, he kind of bears out why you don't follow a legend. Things didn't go particularly well for him, and after the team suffered through a tough season in 1931, there were a group of lawyers in Oklahoma City uh, that started to circulate a petition uh, for uh, not only the removal of Lindsay, but also Benny Owen as the athletic director. Uh, the players were very loyal to both of those guys, and the football players turned the whole petition idea around and started to float their own petition, which was worded mockingly similar to the one that the lawyers had written. The players started to circulate a, a petition to call for the ouster of the debate coach and the chair of the public speaking department. Um, it was viewed, obviously, as, as more of a joke than anything else, and the protest fell on deaf ears, and in, and in March of 1932, Lindsay was out as the head football coach. Owen turned to Vanderbilt assistant Lewis Hartage as the eighth head coach, well aware of his uphill battle, proclaimed before the game. I aim to give Oklahoma a team that it can be proud of, even in defeat. Lewis Hartage, October 1st, 1932. Unfortunately, Hartage had the opportunity to make good on that promise. The Sooners lost more games than they won in his three seasons as coach. The Board of Regents responded by overhauling the program. Hartage was fired and Benny Owen graciously stepped down as athletic director. Lloyd Noble, an oil baron from Ardmore, Oklahoma, and a newly appointed regent took the lead in achieving the new order. Noble approached Lawrence Biff Jones, even offering to pay $2,500 of his salary to justify his move to Oklahoma from Louisiana State University. Jones, disenchanted with the interference he had experienced at LSU, accepted. He was a hard-nosed military man who demanded discipline and respect from his players during the grueling practices throughout the Dust Bowl era. We'd practice in dust storms so thick you couldn't see the sun. By the end of practice, we were covered in thick dust. Gene Carrado, 1935. Jones's first team shut out opponents in its first two games of the 1935 season, beating Colorado 3-0 and stomping New Mexico 25-0. The new coach implemented the wingback system to help strengthen OU's running game. Led by J.W. Dub Wheeler, a lineman, OU rushed for 1,748 yards to finish the season 6-3, its first winning campaign since 1930, and most victories since 1920. In the 1936 season, intense heat hovered over central Oklahoma and 44 athletes lost a combined 252 pounds under their coach's watch. A scoreless tie with Tulsa in the opener was emblematic of the oppressive weather. After only two wins, Jones received word before the final game of the season that he had been assigned to military duty and would be forced to leave the university. That became kind of the twilight time for, for OU football. Uh, that continued through Biff Jones, and then when he left, one of his assistants, Tom Stidham, was promoted to a head football coach, started rebuilding the program, and then the World War II came along and things kind of changed again, but that was a function of World War II. But I think that if you look at the period between uh, the end of the Benny Owen era and Tom Stidham taking over the program, those were the, the waning years, the twilight years, and then when Tom Stidham took over the program, he started building it back into what Benny Owen had created back in the teens and 20s. Stidham was determined to rebuild the Sooners' reputation on the field, and with the increasing popularity of film cameras and radio, America was able to witness the rise firsthand. Walter Cronkite, who later became a staple in American television broadcasting, first won over listeners' hearts in 1937, as he became the first radio voice of the Oklahoma Sooners. In 1937, uh, 
there had been broadcasters doing games before, but uh, it really started uh, the, the uh, tradition of having name broadcasters, although the name wasn't well known at that time. It was 21-year-old Walter Cronkite who had come up to work at WKY Radio in Oklahoma City. He only called that one season, and honestly, uh, he got some critique for it. He, he was not a guy with a sports background. So even though he called the games, um, there were people uh, who were listening who weren't convinced that he had great knowledge. Now, he got better as the year went along, um, but it was interesting that one of his first jobs was calling OU football. Uh, then later, in 1946, Kurt Gowdy winds up calling uh, two seasons, the first of two seasons of OU football, before he goes and joins Red Barber as an announcer for the New York Yankees. So if you look back over the history of broadcasting, two of the bigger names are Walter Cronkite and Kurt Gowdy, and they both had stints calling OU football. Stidham's mark on the program was felt almost immediately as Jack Bear frontlined a Sooners' dominant defense that allowed only 24 points in the entire season. It was Bear's enthusiasm and spirit that led to great success on the field and also carried to his tenure as head baseball coach for Oklahoma, winning a national championship in 1951 as NCAA Coach of the Year. His leadership and Stidham's commitment to defense help OU to a 5-2-2 record in 1937 and foreshadowed a nearly perfect season for the Sooners in 1938. Led by Earl Crowder, Guilford Cactus Face Dugan, and Roland Wadi Young, the Sooners surrendered just 12 points through the regular season, shutting out every conference opponent and winning their first Big Six title since 1920. Undefeated and untied, Tom Stidham Sooners win for Oklahoma its first Big Six football championship. After shutting out Oklahoma A&M 19-0 in Stillwater, the Sooners returned home to prepare for the final game of the season against Washington State. The campus looked different, however. When the team stepped off the bus, they were met with an offer no other Oklahoma squad had received before. The uh, Orange Bowl sent a representative up to campus beforehand, and uh, he was uh, quite a huckster. He really was doing a lot to, to build up interest in the game. He had chalked a lot of the sidewalks, and it was viewed as a very positive experience. In the old days, they actually came to campus and walked around and beat the bushes and tried to say, hey, come to Miami, Florida. Best way to do is try to get them down there with a football team. The campus was buzzing in anticipation of Oklahoma's first bowl game. As the Sooners took to the field against Washington State, looking to complete a perfect regular season. Why do the Sooners have only 12 points scored against them this year? Here's a good demonstration. Ivy throws Emerson for an eight yard loss. Those Sooners mean business now. McCullough passes to Shirk. Ah, that's one of the prettiest plays of the game. Fans are thrilled when Clark completes a beautiful pass to Martin, who makes a good 18 yards. Clark says that's a good play, and so he passes again to Martin. And with beautiful blocking, watch it. He goes on over for the Sooners fourth touchdown. With Clark holding the ball, Boudreaux kicks a perfect goal for the extra point, and the game ends. Score Oklahoma 28, Washington State nothing. The team was excited. I mean, it was the first bowl bid, and uh, there had been a lot of talk about bowl games, and Oklahoma had not played in one, uh, so it was a big deal. Um, they went down and played a very good uh, Tennessee team and, uh, and didn't win the game. But what was more troublesome about the game was the nature of the game itself. It turned into almost a glorified fist fight. There were 220 yards in penalties assessed against the two teams. Uh, two of Oklahoma's better players were ejected from the game. Tennessee had players ejected from the game. And it really is remembered uh, as a game for how ugly it was. Um, uh, Stidham was very disheartened after it was over. He had a gray suit that had been his lucky suit throughout the course of the season. And uh, when he got back to the hotel, he actually uh, went up to his fifth floor room and dropped the suit out the window, and that was the end of the, of the gray suit. The Sooners were toppled by the Volunteers of Tennessee and their legendary coach Bob Nealon, dicing Oklahoma's much-touted defense to score 17 points. The loss left Oklahoma at 10-1. and one. After obtaining their first AP national ranking, the achievements of 1938 instilled a confidence in the returning group of Sooners, a confidence that worried Coach Stidham. We're ripe for a licking, with everybody telling us how good we are. The boys' heads have swelled so much they haven't been able to get their helmets on. We ought to be in better shape. Tom Stidham, 1939. Stidham's teams couldn't match the glory of 1938. The boys in Crimson went 12-5-1 over the next two seasons, despite having Jack Jacobs, 
a player that some old-timers described as the best natural athlete OU has ever had. Indian Jack Jacobs is the greatest punter I ever saw. He was just a really fine high school athlete and great at OU and uh, I ended up being in the service uh, at uh, Marchfield, California where the 4th Air Force team was and ended up getting to be on that team and uh, Jack was the star of that team. He was an Indian from, from Muskogee. Indian Jack Jacobs was my hero. I, uh, when I was in high school, I used to go up to, I got to go to some of the Oklahoma games. My coach took me up there and I'd watch Indian Jack warm up. I wasn't paying any attention to anybody else, Indian Jack Jacobs and the way he kicked the ball. And I got to know him later on a first-hand basis when I went to Oklahoma. What did he do different than other punters? Kick the hell out of it. <laughs> in a surprise move, and with two years remaining on his contract, Stidham announced his resignation to accept the football coaching job at Marquette University in Milwaukee. As the football coaching carousel began to turn in Norman, the world changed more. World War II began. In 1940, Hitler looked towards the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and beyond it, towards another tower, the Statue of Liberty. Conversion to war is being made complete. These are our college men today. Technically skilled, fully trained, graduating into a world at war. On February 3rd, 1941, OU Regents approved the recommendation to hire Dewey Snorter Luster as the 11th head coach of Oklahoma at a rate of $4,500 per year. Luster, a four-time letter winner and captain of Oklahoma's 1920 Missouri Valley Conference Championship team, left his position as backfield coach for the New York Giants to return to his hometown. Luster's new coaching staff included then athletic director Lawrence Jap Haskell and Dale Arbuckle. Dewey was a, was a character. Uh, he had played here. Uh, his eyesight was terrible. Uh, he was odd looking. He was very slightly built. He was a thin, gaunt fella, always dressed in a suit. Uh, he had been a student of the game of football. He had been an assistant coach. He had been a boxer as a young man. That's how he earned his nickname, Snorter. He was small, but he was wiry, tough in the boot. He wasn't, he wasn't big at all, you know. And he's just a good old time coach, and so was Dale Arbuckle, his assistant. I was his top assistant. And on the weekends, I sat up at the press box by telephone conversation with him. Snorter couldn't see. Mm -hmm. he, he, he really didn't know what was going on out there. So, God and I were Snorter's eyes during the ball game. Mm -hmm. But Snorter was a smart coach. Uh, but on Saturdays, <laughs> he did all along. He had an unusual set of circumstances. He didn't have to go out and recruit football players because the Army and the Navy were sending uh, guys yeah. through accelerated university programs. And a lot of them were athletes. And so uh, during Snorter Luster's era, during World War II, he had any number of great athletes playing here uh, who were only gonna be here for a year or two before they went off to do their service. Senior Indian Jack Jacobs led the Sooner offense and a new A formation that Luster brought with him from the Giants. Jacobs averaged 47.84 yards per punt, and the athletic abilities of the senior class led Luster to coin a new term for his upperclassmen, 
the Big Red. Their dominance on the field also carried over to the locker room. Freshman team, I remember playing against the varsity. They, they got all upset if you tore them up, blocked them too good, and then, but you were trying to make the team, you know. You had to join the Blub Blub Club, and that meant the freshmen went in the in where the toilets were, and they, they grabbed your head, and shoved your head down in the toilet, and flushed it, and you had to say Blub Blub three times. <laughs> it wasn't long before Snorter and his team met up with former OU coach Tom Stidham. He brought his Marquette team to Norman during the 1941 season and absorbed a 61-14 blowout at the hands of Snorter's Big Red. Oklahoma went undefeated at home that year, but was less successful on the road and finished at 6-3. Two weeks after the final game, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, sending America headlong into the war, along with 22 OU football lettermen and all of Luster's assistant coaches. Despite depleted lineups on both sides of the ball, Luster was able to coach his team to victory, winning consecutive Big Six championships in 1943 and in 1944. He wasn't successful, really, as a coach in terms of wins and losses. He wasn't that successful. But you have to understand that he was a coach here during the war years. Uh, in 1945, uh, Luster's last season, uh, we lose in Stillwater to the great Bob Fenimore in Oklahoma A&M, 47 to nothing. And that was really the effective end of, of Luster's coaching career. As the war ended and troops began to return home, the Sooners began to rebuild their football roster. Sadly, not all Sooners made it back to Owen Field. Waddy Young was the first consensus All-American at OU and uh, went on to be a war hero. I mean, he was, uh, when he was on campus here, he did a number of things. He was a boxer, a wrestler, a great football player, obviously. But so often you'll hear that uh, someone will suggest, well, we, we should retire this number or that number, and there's never been a number retired at OU. And so you wonder, well, where do you start? Well, uh, maybe it's with a war hero. And, but people don't remember the war heroes from that long ago. And, and Wadi Young was, was truly a war hero. He was killed on a bombing run during uh, World War II. And uh, he was a very significant, uh, um, very significant in, in bombing raids that were made during World War II. And uh, obviously was very significant to OU football as well. But I think he's, he's one of those characters that over the years has, has perhaps been forgotten a little bit. And that's too bad because uh, if you look at what he did as a player and what he did for our country, he's, he's someone whose name should be remembered for all times on this campus. The daunting task of rebuilding the university's football team, putting students back in the classroom, and providing housing for returning veterans landed on the desk of newly appointed president, George Lynn Cross. Snorter retired after the 1945 season. The Regents were talking about this. Lloyd Noble, an oil uh, driller, was on the board and uh, Mr. Noble made the comment one day in a meeting, he said, one thing we could do here at OU, if we really tried, would be we could have uh, what would amount to instant football, great football here. If we'd plan properly, he said, there will be a four-year crop of uh, fine athletes coming out of the service when the war is over. They said, all of them with their eligibility, and none of them have had a chance to play but four years in one. Said, if we can find these youngsters and uh, get them to OU, we could have uh, an instant great football, and uh, almost. And uh, following them up on this, we decided it might be well to get a coach from the service. So uh, Jap Haskell, our athletic director, who was in the Navy, he came up immediately with the name Jim Tatum, who had coached in the Navy, and uh, recommended strongly we get in touch with Jim Tatum. We did this, and Jim indicated an interest. <clears throat> we invited him to come for an interview, and he asked if he could bring with him a prospective assistant coach. And, um, this would be fine, I told him, and uh, he wanted to, he said that this man's name was Wilkinson, or Bud Wilkinson, who, uh, who whom he had known in the Navy, 
And actually, uh, we spent a couple of hours, the uh, Regents, uh, visiting with uh, Tatum and Wilkinson. The Regents went to lunch, and I with them. And at lunch, <coughs> Mr. Noble remarked that Mr. Tatum seemed very competent and doubtless would do a fine job of coaching at OU. But he said, I do wish it was the other way around. He says, I'm just uh, taken by this man, Wilkinson. <laughs> But. said he's uh, such a personality and uh, said I wish he, we were interviewing him for head coach and Tatum as assistant coach and uh, they got to talking then about the ethics that would be involved in offering the job to Wilkinson and uh, asked me what I thought and I suggested that the institution could not uh, ethically offer Wilkinson the job and if Wilkinson would consider the job after having been brought there by Tatum that he wouldn't have the ethics I'd want in a coach. So we solved the problem by deciding to offer the job to Tatum but make it a package deal, both of them or no one. And that way we'd get Wilkinson. In the meantime, though, I wired uh, Tatum uh, to this effect and told him that it was both of them or nothing. He called me by telephone. Uh, in the meantime, Wilkinson decided he wouldn't coach. He was going up to Minnesota and going to the... Uh, real estate business with his father and brother. Okay. I said, well, I'm sorry, Jim, that all I'm authorized to do is just offer the two of you a job. I said, you'll have to work that out yourself. So he got Wilkinson on the line and got Wilkinson to agree to accept the job to help him get the job and uh, told Wilkinson that he could coach during the fall and resign after the season was over and everything be fine. Tatum, to me, I think he probably I, I got to give him credit for starting OU on big time football. The stories are legion about the literally hundreds of players that were called by Tatum to come to Norman um, to try out uh, in 46 for the Sooners because uh, there, there were no rules on tryouts and, and, and there were a couple of hundred at least. That, that rode the bus, rode the train to Norman, uh, tried out for the team, were offered a spot on the, on the roster, or were sent packing. And uh, the, the great line that I remember uh, is one young man's quote at the time saying, I've never seen so many suitcases coming and going in all my life. There, there must have been 500, 500 players that came through that period. War veterans, you know, and very, very few uh, high school players. They had a summer practice where they had, uh, well, they'd have six or eight squads, and they culled guys from from that. And then uh, in the fall, they came back with the the nucleus of who they had uh, culled the team from during the summer practice. Before the war, it was, it was, well, just, you know, straight vanilla. It wasn't professional feeling or anything, and they're rough, tough, and, and just flat dog-eat-dog -dog out there in scrimmages. And uh, the, after the war with Bud and Tatum both, there was more finesse, more, uh, there wasn't that type of football that was, it was just, well, that's when they started to split T, you know, and Bud broke out of it, and it <coughs> took a while for the other teams to get on to what was going on on that T formation, because we'd, it was just amazing. You'd line up, you'd split. If you'd split out a yard, well, you'd, you'd move on out another yard. If he followed you out there, they'll just keep following. <laughs> and it, that T formation was so quick that it was uh, it was just a lot more finesse and and in football after the war than it was before the war. Tatum gave the university what it was looking for, quick success. 
but it came at a high cost, as the coach spent his entire $125,000 budget before the first game. His plane is about 10 minutes away from the airport. Team travel contributed to his budget problems, as Tatum took his Sooners on a rare trip through the air on two planes to play defending national champion Army in New York. He placed his first and third string players on one plane, while keeping his second and fourth string squad on the other, in an effort to ensure fielding a team in the event one of the planes failed to complete the trip. Traveling by air in the 1940s and really up till the mid or late 1950s was exclusively for the rich and famous because air travel was virtually prohibitively expensive. So the idea of flying from Norman, Oklahoma to New York City in 1946 was absolutely astounding. People just would, would read that in the paper and be in shock and amazement that they were going to do that. We, we went play Army the first game. Uh, Tatum was coach. But Bud came in there and we had a squad meeting, you know. We were going to play Army. We were going to stay at Hotel Penn and have dinner at Cafe Rouge. Bud said, now, you know you're at Oklahoma University and you're noted to be in a rough, tough football team, but you can also be a gentleman and be a football player and you can act and dress like one. And he just turned around and walked out. You'd be amazed how, how that affected Because <laughs> here we were, we got a caption when we got off of the airplane in New York City, I never will forget it, it said, finest group of young men just arrived from Oklahoma. <laughs> like I said, a bunch of them never had been on an airplane before. And when we went up to eat, they had seven course dinners. And we didn't know how to eat seven courses. <laughs> we was usually throwing wet napkins and stuff. That started us going and we did act a lot different than we did before the war. The Sooners lost a tight battle at Army 21-7, but fired a shot that was heard around the college football world. The team went undefeated on Owen Field and finished 8-3, behind the leadership of All-Americans Buddy Burris, Plato Andros, and John Rappas. Another bowl game came calling when the Gator Bowl invited the Sooners for a date with North Carolina State in Jacksonville, Florida. As the team prepared for the game, rumors began to spread that Tatum was entertaining overtures from other schools. After that season of 46, uh, when they were preparing for the Gator Bowl, I had not planned to go to the Gator Bowl. I was pretty busy, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, got a call from the same Mr. Noble um, on the 30th of December, and he uh, told me he had heard some disturbing news that uh, the coaching staff, Mr. Tatum was going to take the coaching staff after the Gator Bowl game up to the University of Maryland for an interview. It was the idea that the whole staff would move to Maryland. And he, he said to me, he said, did you ever by any chance tell Wilkinson what we thought about him, how we really wished that he, I said, why well, no, uh, Mr. Noble, this would not be proper for me to tell an assistant coach that we preferred him to the head coach, and this would undermine. And he said, well, said, could you go to uh, Jacksonville and offer him the uh, job in case uh, Tatum, he says, I have it on good authority. I don't know that it's true, but if it is true, offer him the job. If Tatum is leaving, offer him the job at OU at a salary of 10000 a year. After shoring up his position with Wilkinson, Cross watched the Sooners' rushing defense shut down North Carolina State in a 34-13 triumph that gave Oklahoma its first bowl victory. Following the win, Tatum, who was already operating with a $113,000 deficit, decided to celebrate. And, they, and of course, everybody was happy. So Bill Cross was the business manager. Tatum asked Cross, for the check on our guarantee. And he cashed it. And he took most of his football team to Cuba. 
you know, at least it went all over Florida. And he spent the whole damn work. As we know, for the older players, most of whom, not some of whom, most of whom were married by 1946, expected to be rewarded somehow. And that's really a part of the story of the trip to Havana. Then when he came back, uh, Lloyd Noble was impressed with the Board of Regents. And uh, he asked uh, Bill Cross, who was a better manager, and with the team for a report. Spencer's. He says, I'll get you one. And he told him what they did. So uh, Lloyd called Ted Mark Carpet. And then he says, you know, with that kind of finance handling, we can't use you anymore. And uh, he went to, went to Maryland. And of course, Jeff was fired too because <laughs> Although not how he planned it, President Cross had the head coach that many wanted a year earlier, and the expectations soared as Wilkinson's first season as head coach approached. I think there was a sense of the unknown, uh, a new coach who's never been a head coach, who had, who had that regal bearing in organizational skills, and you have to understand that Wilkinson represented the ideal in a post-war uh, culture that looked up to this tall, lean, well-appointed, well articulate man. He was We're the ideal. The he wasn't just a football assignment. coach. He represented a standard to which many Main Street businessmen in the state aspired. In the end, I think he saw the opportunity, the, uh, the passion for football, uh, the football players that were going to be sophomores uh, and uh, knew what they were doing. Uh, and I think he saw the opportunity that uh, he was about, uh, he was on the verge of something uh, special and, and remarkable and gigantic. Uh, it turns out to be the best thing that ever happened to Oklahoma football and the best thing that ever happened to Bud Wilkinson. If you look at the history and the significance of University of Oklahoma football, and if you look at what we know today about OU football, you have to think of Harold Keith, who was a, a writing instructor, uh, who became the first sports publicist, who became the first sports information director ever at any school. All of the books that he wrote on the history of OU football, all of the things that he chronicled from the very earliest days of OU football up into the 1960s, there's so many things that we wouldn't know about those teams and about those players and about specific games if it hadn't been for Harold Keith.